Again, I'm Kevin Appleby. I'm the International Migration Policy Director for Center for Migration Studies. And our panel, our second panel, is going to look at some of the policy and political issues involved in this, uh, this important case. Uh, there are so many tentacles uh, to the case. We learned about all the legal issues in the first panel, and now we're going to talk about the policy implications, the objectives of the President's actions, uh, what the political consequences may be um, in Washington on the Hill, if the court decides either way, um, what some imp imp implementation issues may be if the court says that the administration can go forward, and then what, what maybe the political co consequences may be for the campaign trail um, as we are in election year. And we have a very distinguished panel of experts that will discuss all these issues, so I'm going to introduce them in advance and then to ask them to give uh, opening remarks uh, about some of these issues that uh, I've mentioned. So let me first introduce our panel. Um, this is not going to be in the order that they talk. We're going to have a different order, but I'm going to introduce them this way. Sun Min Kim is the congressional reporter for Politico. Um, she's worked at USA Today and the Star Ledger of Newark, and she has a degree in journalism and political science from the University of Iowa and a master's degree in journalism from American University, and she is current president of DC chapter of Asian American Journalists Association, and Sun Min does a lot of great reporting for Politico on a variety of issues on Capitol Hill. Uh, Jean Atkinson, just to the left of me, is the current executive director of the Catholic Legal Immigration Network. Uh, she also served as the long-term director of the Immigration Legal Services Program for the Archdiocese of Washington, as well as the head of the Catholic Charities Refugee Center. She has, a, uh, she has a, a, a JD from the American University Law School, and she's very involved in planning for the implementation of these programs should they go forward. Mark Walsh uh, is a, 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 a writer and reporter who has covered the U.S. Supreme Court for more than 20 years, uh, including writing for Education Week, and is a contributor to the ABA Journal, the magazine of the American Bar Association, and he also contributes to the SCOTUS blog um, with his writings. And finally, uh, last but not least, is Frank Sherry, who is the founder and executive director for America's Voice, and he served as the executive director of the National Immigration Forum for 17 years. Frank, of course, is uh, often seen in the media, both print and electronic and on TV, uh, speaking about immigration, immigration reform, and the benefit of immigrants to our country. So welcome to all of you and thank you for being here. We're gonna have a different order of speaking. Um, we're gonna have Mark go first, and this is just for the flow of the, the issues. Um, Mark will go first, then Frank, then some men, and then Gene will, will go last. Um, it won't be ladies for us, but we'll save the best for last. So um, without further ado, um, I'll call on Mark to, to give us his opening remarks. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Um, Great to be here, and, and that first panel was uh, did such a good job of teeing up the legal issues. That uh, I'm going to go into uh, some of the, the dynamics of the Supreme Court uh, uh, and how that may play out for this this issue, uh, in this case. Uh, uh, it, 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 I've covered the court for uh, about 20, 25 years, actually, and so not an expert on immigration, but uh, seen lots of uh, issues come before. It. Court and in uh, 2009, when uh, Justice Sotomayor first joined the court, her very first opinion uh, was something assigned to her from the first week of oral argument in a case called Mohawk Industries versus Carpenter. And that uh, uh, is a very obscure case, probably because of a procedural legal issue, actually about attorney client privilege. But the backdrop had something to do with a, a worker who was reporting up the chain of command that his company was. was uh, Documented workers, and, uh, and the, in their opinion, the fact that Justice Sotomayor referred to undocumented immigrants and undocumented workers, as opposed to other terms, was was noted by some as uh, because uh, I think most of the crowd here and, and uh, knows that there's uh, some degree of debate over even the language to be used in these these debates. Uh, a year later, in a, Case from Arizona, not not the, the bigger one that, that came in 2012, but uh, in Chamber of Commerce versus Whiting, that was about the Legal Arizona Workers Act. Uh, Justice Sotomayor um, uh, 
attracted uh, further notice just uh, for, for referring to undocumented aliens. Uh, just an oral argument, I have noticed that and wrote a little something about it. And, uh, Justice Alito said, referred to illegal aliens, talked about uh, the case. And uh, uh, Justice O'Mara actually said illegal aliens once and caught herself, and that's what made me think that she was thinking about the language uh, to be used. Now, fast forward to 2012, and the, the case that we've heard some, something about in the last panel, Arizona versus the United States, about the state provisions. Um, uh, Justice uh, Sotomayor actually referred several times in oral argument to illegal aliens, and Justice Alito, in his opinion, the case referred to undocumented aliens. So I'm not sure what exactly is to be concluded, other than um, that is something that has been on their minds. And, it's not a complete proxy for how they vote in these cases, but it is uh, just part of the backdrop, I think, of this approach to these cases. Um, in that Arizona case, uh, uh, as some of you probably know, uh, Justice Scalia wrote at some length in his dissent about uh, a program that was not at issue in the case. Those were state provisions that were issued, but the initial DACA program had just been announced. And Justice Scalia said, after this case was argued and while it was under consideration, the Secretary of Homeland Security announced a program exempting from immigration enforcement some 1.4 million illegal immigrants under the age of 30. He said he was referring to DACA. Scalia went on, quote, the President said at a news conference that the new program is the right thing to do in light of Congress's failure to pass the administration's proposed revision to the Immigration Act. Perhaps it is, though Arizona may not think so, but to say, as the court does, uh, the majority, that Arizona contradicts federal law by enforcing applications of the Immigration Act that the president declines to enforce boggles the mind. And he uh, even had delivered this dissent in uh, court, uh, which, which the justices do. Um, they feel really strongly about a, a case. It's, it's rare, but, but a few times uh, per term. And then made that point in court. And, it was just very unusual. It, was, it seemed like if he was wanting to go on Fox News or something to talk about the, uh, the DACA program. Um, so now in this case, uh, of course, with Justice Scalia's death, uh, that's one vote that's not available to the state of Texas and the other states. Um, but uh, the posture of the case, the, the states only need four votes to prevail on uh, preserving the preliminary injunction. Uh, and the administration uh, will need five to overcome that. So that's the, the mathematical reality of that. Um, to look back at uh, the Arizona case, again, very different issues, preemption uh, over federal authority over, over state uh, efforts to regulate immigration. Um, still, uh, uh, supporters of the administration appointed to the fact that Justice Kennedy and Chief Justice Roberts joined uh, Justices Ginsburg, Breyer, and Sotomayor to make up the majority that uh, uh, struck down uh, three of those provisions. Uh, Justice Kagan was not in the case. Um, uh, Justice Kennedy, this has been quoted quite a bit in the briefs, or said a principal feature of the removal system is the broad discretion exercised by immigration officials. Discretion in the enforcement of immigration law embraces immediate human concerns. Unauthorized workers trying to support their families, for example, likely pose less danger than alien smugglers or aliens who commit a serious crime. The equities of an individual case may turn on many factors, including whether the alien has children born in the United States, long ties to the community, or a record of distinguished military service. Um, Again, as I said, that, that's, that was the Arizona case, not necessarily a predictor of how uh, any particular justice will rule in, in this case. Um, I want to mention something. Uh, you know, we had quite a bit of discussion of the standing uh, uh, issue that does kind of dominate the briefs. It is a threshold issue. I, I have to point out that uh, because I read a lot about education issues in the Supreme Court, Texas, uh, both in its cert petition and in its merits brief, uh, uh, 
made the points about not only driver's licenses, which is the basis the lower courts found standing, but about all the costs for education and health care you know, that, that uh, it must uh, bear uh, because of illegal immigration. Uh, and, and just in the, in the field of education, it, it pointed out in its parents' brief, every child that costs us $7,903. And uh, in a recent year, we spent $58 million on uh, educating children, I'll call undocumented uh, aliens. Um, um, and, and, you know, this is the, the standing issue I think will be important to the court, uh, but uh, in a recent case, uh, the pending case from Texas that deals with affirmative action, uh, many standing arguments have been raised about the uh, student who was denied admission to the University of Texas at Austin. This is the second visit of the Fisher case to the Supreme Court, and the, the members of the court have just blown past all these arguments about standing, and they just just didn't address them, haven't answered them, and, and they're not likely to in that case. But in most cases where serious threshold questions are raised, the court does address them. And certainly, the government, the uh, that the federal government, um, is going first in this case, and, and, and stressing the standing. Argument. Um, uh, as it was mentioned, uh, the, the court uh, has expanded the oral argument in this case to 90 minutes. Uh, that's next Monday. That's 30 more than usual. Uh, uh, on the administration side, there'll be 35 minutes for the Solicitor General, 10 minutes for the interveners, which are three uh, mothers who are, would be eligible for DAPA. They're represented by MALDEF. And on the state side, uh, there'll be 30 minutes uh, for, for Texas, uh, and, uh, 15 minutes uh, the, the court uh, granted to the U.S. House of Representatives, uh, which is uh, represented by the Bancroft Law Firm, that's Paul Clement's uh, firm, although uh, another lawyer in that firm is the counsel of record, Aaron Murphy, uh, and it's not clear who's going to argue. But the court basically kind of likes these big cases to to have uh, some more views, and, and, and these parties ask for those views. And it is unusual for the, the House to be involved, but, but this, the House uh, or various entities of the House have been involved in other big cases recently, like the Affordable Care Act. And I think the court would like to get uh, those views uh, before. And, and actually, I, I would recommend the brief of the, of the House of Representatives as presenting pretty cogently the arguments on that side of the case. Uh, maybe better than the state, which had to deal with standing and all the other arguments. And the, the House just kind of focuses on uh, some of the merits uh, issues. Uh, and we, I think we could talk about possible outcomes as we go along, so I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thanks, Mark. Um, and we'll have some, I have some follow-up questions for you on, on the board, but we'll save those till after we talk, so Frank. Well, thank you. Um, I have nothing to offer in terms of legal insight. Uh, I, I, I've been talking to lots of lawyers recently, and that old adage that if you talk to two lawyers, you get three opinions proves to be true. Uh, this is an, obviously a very complicated case. So for me, I see this um, in the context of the long-term effort to uh, enact immigration reforms, particularly those that will benefit the 11 million or more undocumented immigrants who live in America. So, uh, you know, the context for this case, which is, you know, we're not supposed to talk about it because uh, this is about high-minded principles of uh, uh, separation of powers and uh, standing and so forth, but uh, the fact is, is that Congress blocked reform. Uh, the president acted. Congress could not block the president legislatively, and so they went to the courts. Um, uh, both Congress and, of course, uh, the state of Texas on behalf of 26 governors and AGs. Um, and it's part of a long-term struggle that um, is playing out in a way that I find kind of remarkable. We see it in the election. And, and so I just like to talk about how I see the Supreme Court case in the context of the, the immigration reform battle. Um, for us, if the Supreme Court uh, decides in favor of the government's position, and we can implement the program. Jean Atkinson, who's an expert on it, will talk about what that means. And she and her colleagues have been doing just terrific work getting ready. And I think, you know, the big question everybody will be asking is, will people apply? 
Um, my own two cents is that I'm going to tell everyone in, in, in my circle that I know that's eligible to apply. Um, that it's much better to have a piece of paper in hand uh, before a change of administration than to wait to see what a new administration will do. It's a lot easier to cut off new applications than it is to take uh, away a benefit that's already been granted. Um, so uh, that may not be what everybody does. I suspect many undocumented immigrants will be, become very familiar with the uh, RCP and HuffPost polling averages to see uh, who's leading the presidential race because it's pretty clear we'll have a Democratic candidate who will promise to defend and, and expand, if possible, on the executive action and that we'll have a Republican nominee who will promise to, on day one, uh, rescind uh, any executive action. So uh, that's going to be, I think, loom large over uh, the decisions about whether to apply or not. Um, but I think, you know, just to address the political fallout of, uh, of this, I mean, first of all, the, a legalization program, it's not a legalization program per se, but the idea of people getting work permits and protection from deportation for, what, 3.7 million people under DAPA, another 3 million under expanded DACA, uh, on top of the 700,000 plus who have DACA now with uh, a, a bigger number that can age into the program. We're talking about maybe 5 million or so undocumented immigrants becoming um, able to work and live without fear of deportation. That's uh, a little less than half the undocumented population, but it's, uh, to me, it would be a turning point uh, in the immigration reform debate where it would be all but over. Um, if you look at executive actions in the past, what tends to happen is that there's there's more controversy on the front end. Once they've been implemented, they become a stepping stone to legislation where they become codified. Um, and so I actually expect that to happen in this case, that, um, uh, that a, 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 a successful implementation of a deferred action program, uh, DACA Plus and uh, DAPA, would, would be um, the beginning of the end of this debate over whether to legalize 11 million people in the United States or not, one of the most contentious issues in our politics. Um, obviously, the decision matters hugely in terms of w what, what is the decision? Does it allow, if, if there's a win for our side, does that mean, is the nature of the decision such that there is room to expand on it or not? That's going to become incredibly important. Should a Democrat uh, get elected as the next president? Both can leading candidates have promised to go further than um, under the extent allowed under the law. So does the Supreme Court, what kind of limiting principles do they enunciate, if any, um, in a decision that might uh, keep a Democratic president from, from doing additional, taking additional executive action? So I think that's going to be an important thing uh, to look at. The question of whether DACA, the original DACA, gets put in jeopardy by the decision, I think is going to have huge uh, implications as well. Um, just from a political point of view, I can't imagine that Republicans would really want to pick a fight with 700,000 Dreamers, but if they do, and their allies, but if they do, um, I suspect that's a fight that ultimately they will lose. Um, so uh, the decision matters hugely in terms of the future of immigration reform and protections for millions of people. Um, it also matters in terms of what's next for the immigration debate. Uh, whether there's future executive actions or, or, or legislation on the other side of the election. Um, in terms of the immediate political ramifications of a decision, I often get asked the question, what, what is likely to be the impact on voter turnout and voter uh, activity, voter behavior, uh, in 2016? Uh, I mean, to be blunt and just to be, you know, straightforward on it. I mean, it's one of those situations where for advocates of immigrants, it's kind of heads we win, tails you lose. If the decision is favorable, there will be a tremendous call in the community to mobilize to defend the win because it'll be up to the next president to decide whether it goes forward or it stops on day one. If there's a loss, I think it's not likely uh, given eight justices and for relatively liberal judges, but if there's a loss, it'll be punish the people who uh, brought the case forward and defend the existing DACA um, to the extent possible. So I think that'll also have a mobilizing effect. Um, 
Uh, will it say if uh, a Donald Trump is the nominee? Will it incur? Will he be able to use it in his rallies and uh, bring more voters to his side? Uh, my own view is that he's pretty much topped out even within the Republican Party in terms of the support he has for his views, um, uh, and that it would be it would be rather difficult to build on that saying elect me so I can take work permits away from dreamers. Um, that probably won't be his message, but that will be the effect. And I do think that um, I'm not sure that that, uh, uh, even though there's divided public opinion on this issue of executive action, that it's going to be a clear winner beyond the base of support that he's already activated, or, or that Ted Cruz speaks to as well. Um, the, the prospect of a tie, which is something that I, I suspect a lot of Supreme Court watchers are saying, well, a lot, a lot of cases have ended up in ties recently. Maybe this one will too. Um, but uh, again, I'm not a legal expert on this, but it seems to me if the Fifth Circuit decision is left standing, but it's not nationally binding, it opens up the opportunity for, lit for cases to be brought in, say, New York and California, other districts, where you could have different decisions. And so depending on how long it takes for this case to work its way back up to the Supreme Court when there are nine justices to finally resolve the case, um, that you could have a situation where in the western states people are coming forward and applying and getting DACA DAPA and uh, people in the s southern region are not, uh, and that uh, you could have a bit of judicial chaos as a result of a uh, tied Supreme Court um, where there's not a decision that's nationally binding. So I'd be interested in what the people who actually know more about the Supreme Court think about that prospect. Um, finally, um, I do think that, uh, I mean, the only scenario that really hurts us as immigration reformers would be if we lose in the Supreme Court and who gets elected is an ardent opponent of immigration reform. Um, and I think we know which party that comes from. I work for a C4 organization, so I can talk honestly. If the Republicans win the presidency, I'm sorry, if, I, if, I, if I'm violating any tax codes, you let me know, Kevin, but if the Republicans, and I, I, think that, I think analytically this could be said without, uh, as a fact-based assertion rather than a political assertion, that if the Republican uh, uh, candidate wins the presidential election, um, that it, all hell's gonna break loose on the immigration front. There's gonna be attempts to move forward with aggressive enforcement and no doubt uh, a, a, ter, ter, a huge effort to resist those efforts. And so um, I don't look forward to that scenario, but if the day comes, it'll match the strength of immigrants and their allies and the many constituencies that stand with the immigrant community and in favor of reform against a uh, newly elected uh, president um, who will try to uh, turn the screws with ramped up enforcement and ramped up deportations. I think that would be a pretty ugly scenario. Um, I was kind of amazed by that Boston Globe fake headline about the Trump presidency where the main headline was deportations begin and the subheading was riots continue. Um, I thought that was a little dramatic. Uh, I don't expect riots, I don't expect violent reaction, but I expect a whole lot of nonviolent uh, resistance and civil disobedience should a Republican president get. But that's, that's the scenario that I don't think is gonna happen. Um, I think it's more likely that we're going to end up with a Democratic president. Um, I think we're more likely to end up with a Democratic Senate. Um, I do not know if it will be such a wave election where the House will be put in play. Most experts say impossible, too many seats to win. The Republicans have the largest majority in decades. And that probably the scenario, even if it's a big win for Democrats on election day, that uh, the House may lose some seats but wouldn't lose the majority. Well, that sets up the same scenario we had in 2014. Uh, I'm sorry, 2013, uh, after the 2012 election. Uh, Republican candidate ran hard against immigrants, lost big Latino, Asian uh, American vote, was considered of huge consequence in a number of swing states. Many Republicans said we have to get this issue in our rearview mirror. The Senate passed a bill. The House couldn't muster the support or the, the guts to bring up uh, a bill, even though it would have passed with mainly Democratic votes, I think. Uh, some people disagree with that, but in any case, uh, uh, the Republicans under operating under the so-called Hassert rule of won't bring up anything that doesn't have a majority of the majority, never brought up immigration reform, never tested whether there was enough support for it, 
and uh, that actually paved the way for uh, Obama to take unilateral action. Um, so uh, one can envision a scenario in which we are, you know, the Senate passes a bill, the president is saying it's a priority, and instead of John Boehner as speaker, we have Paul Ryan as speaker. Um, and as is widely noted, right and left, especially on the right, uh, Paul Ryan is uh, what they call soft on immigration, what we call uh, sensible on, on immigration. Um, uh, and would he have the guts that John Boehner did not have to bring forward legislation even if uh, he didn't have the support of half of his members? All of that remains to be played out. Um, uh, but that, that's why it's so important that the nature of this Supreme Court decision and whether there's room for future executive action, not just defending what is in, what is in place, I think will be uh, something that many of us will be watching. You know, Hillary Clinton said, I'm going to go further than the president if I can. And there was a lot of people saying, oh, that's BS. You can't go further. It's, you know, there was a limiting principle in the OLC memo, et cetera. What, what is she talking about? Well, uh, those close to her were saying, well, look, deferred action exists now. It's done for on a case-by-case -case basis in a small number of cases. Is there any problem with just expanding the deferred action, you know, not necessarily with th these categories of people being eligible, but encouraging people to make an affirmative application for it? Anyway, it's an interesting question, and that's why the nature of that decision, I think, will have a big impact on the future of executive actions should legislation have to wait until Probably uh, either Republicans decide to sue for peace or Democrats take over both chambers of Congress, neither of which I think is likely to happen if we don't have reform in 2017 in the first year. So uh, important implications for the debate. F fundamentally, I think our, we're strong. Public opinion, constituency support, good policy. Um, I think that uh, we're going to win. The question is when, not if. Man, I sure hope it's soon. Thank you, Frank. And I do think there's a, enough evidence in the public record to support your analysis. Okay, good. <laughs> so, Nick. All right. Um, I won't rehash a lot of the political points that Frank touched on, but I do want to look at um, just how immigration reform has been from the Hill perspective and just how dramatically um, Congress, and particularly the Republican Party, is from, you know, just post-2012 when the momentum for immigration reform on Capitol Hill was stronger than it had been in a generation. Um, and a lot of it, and, the, and the, how it's evolved has had a lot to do with, you know, what the president did on executive action, a lot of the political climate out there. Um, obviously, it doesn't have to, you know, doesn't have to be stated, like, that there is a very, you know, pessimistic outlook on immigration reform right now. Um, and I'm not quite sure. It will, it'll depend on the election results in uh, this November, if, there is, if, if the Republican candidate loses as badly as Mitt Romney did in that, as it did in 2012, maybe there will be another impetus for doing immigration reform in 2017. But if you look at the dynamics, you know, obviously, even with a Democratic president and a Democratic Senate, the issue of passing immigration reform was still in the Republican House. And a lot of those dynamics, you know, regardless of what kind of a wave election we have this year, won't change. Um, but you do see some of the, the politics of the this executive action and the court case playing out. And what I, what I wanted to, and again, I don't want to rehash any, a lot of the Points, but I do want to discuss a little bit how each chamber of Congress is handled um, and both led by Republicans this uh, the Supreme Court case. Obviously, the House has taken a very active role. Um, you know, Speaker Paul Ryan took the kind of the very unusual, almost unprecedented step of having a you know amicus brief, a friend of the court brief submitted on the House's behalf. It was it was basically a party line, party line vote um, because basically almost all Democrats in Congress, both in the House and Senate, have submitted the biggest briefs defending the administration, saying, you know, these programs should be upheld and we support what the administration did. Um, only about five House Republicans uh, defected from, uh, from, the, uh, from the House Republican position, and a lot of them are, you know, like the Mario Diaz, the Lords of the World, who, um, he's been a long uh, supporter of immigration reform, Carlos Corbella of Florida, who also supports immigration reform, is in a very, very tough re-election race in his Miami district. So you do see how the politics are of this, even this decision hanging in the balance are, are playing out. But what I thought was really interesting was actually what the Senate did um, in its, uh, they also submit, submitted uh, an amicus brief on behalf of Senate Republicans, not on behalf of, they, you know, Mitch McConnell didn't force a vote like uh, Speaker Ryan did. But uh, what I found really interesting, so they submitted this brief last week, and 
you have to look at the Republicans who didn't sign. Obviously, the, you know, the, the race for control of the Senate is a lot more um, interesting and a lot more up in the air than the race for the House. Um, if you look at the Senate Republicans who didn't sign on, um, if you look at, so the four of the, so there are, of the five most vulnerable Senate Republicans running in very purple states or even a blue state, four of them chose not to sign. Um, so you have Kelly Agon in New Hampshire, Ron Johnson in Wisconsin, Mark Kirk in Illinois, Rob Portman in Ohio, and um, Pat Toomey of Pennsylvania. And of those five in the toughest re-election races, uh, where every vote's going to, you know, every, obviously every vote's going to uh, count in, in those cases, only Ron Johnson chose to sign. Um, and you know the senators, if you ask them, would say, "Oh no, like we don't support these executive actions. We're on record not supporting them." But the fact that four of the five didn't sign is not a coincidence. I mean, this you, you kind of see how the political impact would play. They, you know, regardless of what they say, they may not have wanted their names associated with that brief. Also interesting are you know senators, or Republican senators who come from very uh, Latino-heavy states who may not necessarily be up for re-election this year. Also chose not to sign. It was Jeff Flake of Arizona, who, as we know, is a longtime uh, proponent of immigration reform, um, as well as uh, Dean Heller of Nevada and uh, Cory Gardner of Colorado. So it's interesting to see. You know, there are Senate Republicans who do recognize the implications of doing this. I do, and I think um, Senate Republicans, both in the House and the Senate, have been looking at this broader legal fight. And, and executive actions, not necessarily as an immigration thing, but an executive overreach issue. So you're kind of so Senate Republicans say, or Republicans are kind of coming at it with that, coming at it with that lens, and they're saying, you know, this is not, you know, not necessarily focused on immigration, but the fact that the president over, you know, overstepped and overreached his power. But obviously, the political implications, the underlying um, issue of immigration is there. So. It's, so how whatever result comes down in June and how Republicans and how that reverberates into the big job center is going to be. Thank you. Great. Um, this has been a really great legal and policy discussion. I'm happy to be here, so I'd like to start by thanking CMS. Um, I would agree it's kind of down to the level of why this matters, why we're also interested, and that is, of course, the people who will benefit from this immigration action. I would say that the immigration services field is larger, more coordinated, more diverse, and more prepared than it has ever been to serve the immigrant community. Um, and just to give you a sense of the world, I'm talking about clinics network, my organization's network comprises approximately 285 agencies around the country that provide legal services to immigrants. I'm also speaking about the Committee for Immigration Reform, which clinic is one of three co-chairs and manages, um, which is comprised of about 27 national organizations as well as additional organizations on working groups. And those organizations, some of them have their own networks as well, such as National Council of the Rasa. So, you know, we feel pretty good, I would say, you know, with it as we were tested in November 20th when the president made the announcement and within hours, we being this larger group of organizations had resources available. We will do the same post a Supreme Court decision. Um, one of our goals is to reach further. If you think of concentric circles and you have the organizations that serve and have been serving immigrants or have built up their own capacity to serve immigrants, we need to reach some of these non-traditional organizations. It could be more schools, health clinics, libraries, and we have been working on that. But I want to mention some challenges that impact the field kind of writ large, and it is also making it very difficult to build up capacity in these further out um, layers and, and circles. Um, in spite of us being larger, more diverse, and more prepared, we, we know that we lack the resources that we will need to serve all the people who need assistance. Based on prior immigration programs, the expectation is that about half of the people who apply will need some kind of a touch from a nonprofit immigration organization about half of those will need deep assistance. Um, if we're not able to serve them, we run the risk that we will miss the most vulnerable people, people who are in remote communities, people with English language issues, particularly non-Spanish English language issues, farm workers. And if we can't reach them, of course, the risk of them being abused by people committing consumer fraud or notario fraud just, just goes up. 
So we had kind of this mission to, and this again, the larger we, uh, to build up capacity in the immigration field. And I wanted to raise some of the reasons we have been challenged. I'll list three, they're, they're not, they're obvious, but I think they're worth raising. And to start off, we heard Karen Crise this morning laid out the process that's happened with the court case that is now before the Supreme Court. So we had the district court's injunction. We had the Fifth Circuit's action to deny the stay to uphold the injunction. We had the case going to the Supreme Court, and now the uncertainty of the outcome of the Supreme Court. All of this is on top of us hoping and expecting that we would have immigration reform in other time periods. So kind of again and again, people are taking these hits we get excited and then it's like never mind. So the agencies more and more are struggling with where they put their resources and their energy and just kind of motivation levels. And so we're it's a mixed bag that we're hearing from many that we're not going to do anything. We will wait until we know for sure that there's going to be an immigration action for us to implement. And that that is obviously very worrisome for us. I would say the second issue is uncertainties over funding. Um, raising the amount of funding that we need for this program has been very difficult. I think in part because the program is executive action. If it were a bipartisan congressional program, I think we would see more, more funding. We found that some foundations have been wary to step up with large amounts of money and that it's been challenging to bring in individual donors and foundations that don't normally play in the immigration arena because they do see this as kind of a political issue. And again, you know, there may be others who are very revved up and very excited about doing that, but we know at this point we're not seeing the funding coming that we need to implement. Anti-immigrant sentiment has also impacted, and I'm at this point I'm talking about the agencies themselves that are considering expanding their services or starting immigration legal service programs. Um, the, the sentiment makes some of the leadership of the agencies afraid that they will either get pushback in their communities or from their supporters, and so they have been a little bit hesitant. And we've seen in the context of Syrian refugee backlash, immigration programs being threatened and having issues, and this just makes them kind of naturally want to pull back, particularly those who are broad service agencies and feel like they need to be able to serve all the vulnerable people in their communities. Um, so the opposite side of the coin, which Frank mentioned is, will people apply? And I agree 100% with Frank. Our message, at least our message is, we want you to apply. We want you to get this benefit. You think you'd be better off. Um, we have not seen a time when an administration has taken away the benefit for someone who has paid for and approved the benefit, and gotten an approval of the benefit. So we think it is protective. And then you have more people, I guess <coughs> Frank mentioned, who can argue for the continuation of the program. One factor, of course, that's going to impact the size of the first wave of applicants, and it's quite possible we'll see people in waves as their comfort level where they hear other people being approved, um, is that capacity that we have. So it goes back to what I've just been mentioning. If organizations are out there from day one conducting outreach, calling their potentially eligible clients, we know that some are keeping lists, which is great, holding lots of workshops, then we will get more people applying. Um, and again, it's, it is about changing the life of the people who apply, um, both economically, educationally, other positive outcomes for people who receive the expanded DACA and the DAPA, as well as the more than 10 million people living in households with individuals, many of whom are U.S. citizens. And quite frankly, our communities and countries benefit as well. So this is good for all of us. Um, some of the same factors come into play as for the individuals, of course, many people are afraid due to the very, very ugly rhetoric that we've heard from the presidential candidates, questions about whether the next president will end the program. Um, Anti-immigrant sentiment in certain areas has caused less enthusiasm among the immigrant community. And then I think the effect of the enforcement actions and raids <coughs> that started in early January and have continued kind of at a smaller scale um, have really frightened people. And those are family-focused enforcement has hurt trust in the community. And in fact, some of those same people are people who would be eligible for the DAPA. So that sounds pretty negative. I think the positive here is that, um, again, even if the Supreme Court rules the way we would like it to rule, we get this positive
positive decision. There are many people who still need immigration reform. Um, if the Supreme Court gives out a negative decision, there are many, there's still much that we can be doing and we need to be doing. Starting now, we can be helping people gather their documentation. It's an excellent opportunity to have an engagement with a person, find out if they qualify for another benefit. A study that clinic worked on with CMS found that more than a survey found that more than 15% of people interviewed for DACA were eligible for some other form of relief. So we are talking potentially very large numbers of people who right now, regardless of what the Supreme Court does, can ameliorate their, their status. So I'd like to end on that kind of positive note. Thank you. Thank you, Jean. Thanks to all our speakers. I have a couple of follow-up questions. I'm going to direct them to one individual, but I'll feel free to respond. Um, so Mark, I, I wanted to ask about, since you're a court watcher, um, first of all, is it possible that the justices are, are deadlocked and decide to defer their decision until there's a ninth justice? Can they, do they have that ability or they, has that ever been done and is that in play here? So that's a good question because once Justice Scalia died, in February, uh, there was a lot of discussion, like what happens now with some cases that, based on oral argument, we think they're pretty divided and you can divide it four and four. Uh, what happens now? Do they, the, the normal custom of the court, when it ties in a case, and there's there's often sometimes an individual justice is out of a case just because of a recusal or, or sickness uh, that comes up, and then to, in the norm, the normal outcome is. Uh, We've seen recently with two cases, uh, is the court announces the tie and says the, the judgment of the lower court is affirmed by an equally divided court, Supreme Court. Um, but there is this other option of holding a case over. Um, uh, there's also the option of the court uh, announcing a tie and then granting rehearing, which which the, one of the parties in one of the cases that just kind of was the loser of the deadlock situation, which was a Friedrichs case involving uh, public employee union fees for, for uh, non-members, uh, said, that's what we're going to do. And then they found a brief that looked back and pointed out to the court many times that they had uh, re reheard cases after a four to four tie and after announcing uh, a deadlock. But those, the last example of that was in 1947. So it's, the court has not tended to do that more recently. Um, and then the, the, you know, the political reality, or the reality that everyone knows is, is what's going on across the street uh, in the Capitol. We're not sure when we're going to get another member. So do we do, we do that? Um, so I think this court is disinclined to say, oh, we have, we're, we're tied, so we're going to just hold on to this see when we get another justice. I think they truly can't work it out. They're going to announce the deadlock. Um, uh, but what we've also seen, if I could just add, is that uh, they're, I think, trying not to deadlock. And, and we've seen that in, in the, the contraceptive mandate case, uh, where the court was clearly kind of divided four to four based on oral argument. But the court came back within a week to the parties and said, what if you did this, and what if you did this, they were really trying to play uh, mediator, and then the parties in that case just came back this week, and yesterday, and said, we could maybe go along with that, and uh, now that's not very likely in the immigration case, because of the posture of it, and, and uh, it's a just much different case. Um, but it's a very good question, like, would the court just hold on to it until uh, uh, Ninth Justice is confirmed, and because of the political realities and the fact that it just it's generally disinclined to do that, it's, it's unlikely, but I would really rule it out. It would certainly politicize the uh, Garvin nomination even more so, <laughs> wouldn't it? Um, another quick follow-up, and um, given that you, you've, you, you started your talk with talking about how they use different language, and it's hard to predict um, where the justice may go individually, is it safe to say that that Justice Kennedy is really the, the swing vote here, um, the the one vote that could make make the difference between a deadlock and a straight favorable ruling? Um, 
certainly he could be. Justice Kennedy, uh, as many of you know, is at the center of the court on many issues. He doesn't like to be described as the swing vote. He told an audience at Harvard Law School, cases swing, I don't. Uh, but he, he uh, uh, where, where now that Justice Kagan you know, is back in this case, so you do have eight, uh, if, if one presumes that the liberal bloc were to back the administration, um, they would need either Justice Kennedy or Chief Justice Roberts. So based on, as I you know, described, the Arizona de decision, uh, that's where one or both of them might join the liberal bloc. Frank, uh, uh, and some men or anyone who wants to respond to this, I'm going to move to uh, the, the White House across the street here and ask you, how big is this decision for the President's legacy on immigration? I mean, as we recall, he's, as a candidate, he promised immigration reform in his first year. We're hearing those promises again. Um, and now we're at the end of his administration, and really that legacy depends on what nine people decide down the, on the other end of Pennsylvania Avenue. So what are the what are the, uh, the legacy issues for the president in terms of this decision? Is, is it as big as the health care decision was for him, or is it comparable? So that when the history is written and they look at his immigration record, how will it be written depending on how this decision goes? Um, I think, obviously, the Supreme Court case has huge implications for what history will say on the record on immigration. Um, I do think this court, or the court decision is probably going to have a bigger influence on that legacy than perhaps the court decision on the health care case, because President Obama got a health care law passed. He does, you know, you know, even if they, even if the court had ruled last year, or against, um, against the administration on Obamacare, I mean, he would have, the per, he would have had this law in place for at least five years and whatnot. President Obama doesn't have a law on immigration um, that he can look to. I mean, obviously the Senate passed it with 68 votes in 20, you know, 2013, but I, I don't, I'm not sure history really gives the president credit for trying if it doesn't actually become law. I mean, so I think if it's struck down, I don't know what, um, what, what people are going to be pointing to um, in terms of his, you know, his eight years on immigration is that he tried to get a bill passed and it didn't. Um, he could have, you know, there's an argument that you could have tried to do it in his first term when Democrats controlled both chambers of Congress, and he chose not to do that. He chose instead to do um, the health care law. And there's, and there's differing opinion on whether he would have, like, whether the Democrats were in place to be able to pass immigration reform at the time, but that's another, another point for another time. Um, but in terms of, it, but if there is no upholding of the DACA program, obviously against DACA, and that was a, that was a big, um, Part of his legacy, but there will also be parts of his legacy that will point to the number of deportations under his, uh, under his administration, and that's huge for the advocacy community. Um, and obviously, the controversial raids that have been going on earlier this year. So it'll be, I mean, if the Supreme Court um, doesn't uphold this case, I think he will have a really next um, legacy on immigration. Soon appearing a Politico, a story by some man. <laughs> we'll only need a few quotes from Kevin and I and a few others to fill it out. That was beautifully said. I think that's right. I mean, look, I mean, in fairness to the Obama administration and to the president, the or maybe not in fairness, but just to just to acknowledge that the ground shifted under their feet. They came in operating from the point of view that if they aggressively enforced the law, it would attract Republican support for comprehensive immigration reform and that it was the necessary price to pay to get what at the time was viewed as the only way forward for uh, to, to, to improve our immigration system. Um, the Republicans obviously chose uh, an obstructionist approach uh, that uh, was largely successful except for a few issues, and uh, certainly on immigration and, uh, until, until after the 2012 election, and then and only in the Senate. So. Um, DACA will be an important part of his legacy. 2.8 million deportations will be an important part of his legacy. Uh, this case, I think, will decide whether he's viewed as more the deporter in chief or more the deporter in chief who did right by 5 million people. And I do 
want to add, I mean, obviously the president can't hold, like can't take the entire blame for not being able to move the House Republicans. House Republicans are in a very <coughs> difficult. Um, I mean, that's a very diverse and difficult conference to move such an issue such as complex and emotional immigration reform forward. But obviously, he promised it in his first term, didn't happen. Almost got there in his second term, didn't happen. So that was the kind of view from the legislature. I have one quick follow-up. So, uh, say a Democrat wins the White House, either uh, Secretary Clinton or, or Senator Sanders, does a negative decision put more pressure on them uh, to try to get immigration reform done earlier in their administration? Is there any sort of effect of a negative decision on how they would proceed? And I guess you could make the uh, make the other inquiry is that if it, if it is a positive decision, does it ease the pressure on them to move quickly and they can sort of <coughs> pick their spots depending on how the politics plays out in their first and second year of their term? That's a good question, Kevin. <laughs> I mean, I think if it's a negative decision. Um, but I, mean, I think if a Democrat gets elected president, they're going to uh, and assuming, I think that the Senate flips. I think both of those conditions are kind of necessary. They'll, they'll, they're, they're going to look really hard at making a, a run at immigration reform fairly early in the in the term. I predict. Uh, so yeah, uh, and I think a negative decision may may increase the urgency, but may make it more difficult for Republicans to play. I think they were kind of winning. Um, uh, but the, the, the other thing that even if even if there's a negative decision on Nakadapa, the other part of the executive actions which gets too little attention is the shift in enforcement priorities. There's a lot of work. It's not it's not a, it wouldn't be about necessarily a lot of folks getting work permits, but if the projections are right about how many people are low priority and that definition could also be worked on, you, you could have millions of people who are living in a de facto non enforcement situation. Um, so. I do think that even if there's a negative decision, there's still things that can happen on the executive action side, on the uh, enforcement side, uh, the prioritization of enforcement, that could be, uh, uh, that could help immigrants as well. Not as much as implementation, but, but significantly. Um, if there's a negative decision from the, or the if, if the court rules against the administration of the Supreme Court, I think it highlights the fact that Congress really is kind of the only area where immigration reform, uh, big scale changes to the immigration system can happen. So I think there'll be pressure that way just by that fact. But um, but if you know if there is a ruling against the administration and there is a Democratic president, a lot, and I touched on this in the opening remarks, but a lot of what Republicans had issue with was just the trust factor from Obama. And that, you know, we're trying to get it done, but we don't, we didn't necessarily trust Obama to not circumvent what they felt was the law to get you know, achieve this objective. Obviously, the president's not going to be in office next year. But if a Democrat is, if it, if a Democrat is president, I mean, whether it's um, Secretary Clinton or Senator Sanders, they both pledge. You know, they both defend these programs, and they both uh, pledge to go further than Obama did. So it's hard to see how that dynamic is still not there. Um, the, the trust issue, when they promised to go further than you know President Obama did. Um, but I do think whatever the margin of the um, in terms of the political impetus, obviously the margin of the of the vote in November will matter significantly, obviously, and particularly the margin of Latino and Asian voters. Um, whether that leads to something, I mean, I'm, I'm always skeptical. I am skeptical, um, but uh, but obviously that will increase political pressure like it did in 2012. Okay, thank you. Um, I thought I think we'll go to the floor now and see if anyone has questions. If we have about 50. Minutes. And please, please identify yourself. Hello. Um, thank you for the discussion. I really enjoyed it. Um, but my name is Pedro Gutierrez. I'm with the Office of the Attorney General. And uh, my question is uh, kind of, you know, that it's great that we're starting to shake the rafters on immigration reform and with this immediate need of it. And um, if the president's executive actions are kind of rejected, and I, of course, somewhat depending on the who the next president is, depending if it's Democrat or Republican, what do you think could be the next step, um, policy-wise, 
um, after this? Um, I mean, you don't have to be too specific. I know that's a broad question, but what could be the next possible outcome? Or the um, are we going to go back to the bill and try to go through the House again, or is it going to become um, it's just going to leave it up to the states, or are some states going to speak out? Um, so, what are your thoughts on that? Not all at once. <laughs> Uh, well, I don't, you know, I think, uh, I, I mean, I think if it, there's a negative decision, there's going to be some recalculation by both sides. Um, I think, I, don't, I think in some ways, um, it, it, of course, it depends on how the election goes, but um, assuming that we have a Democratic president and a Democratic Senate, um, I think the incentives will still be there to, to stick to the immigration reform sort of model. Um, I, I don't think there'll be a retrenchment, uh, certainly from from the Democratic side, uh, as to what we can achieve and not achieve. Um, I think the forces are just too strong uh, to go backward. Um, it, and as some men and Frank said, the dynamics of the politics of a negative decision will have to play out. But I think the fundamentals are still there for immigration reform to move forward at some point in the future. Um, it, it, it's just when that will happen and, and in what form. So um, yeah, I don't know if I'm answering the question you posed, but I, I, don't, I don't think the next president, if it's a Democrat, is going to say, OK, well, we're just going to we're going to throw with the enforcement priorities and, and uh, you know, try to pass action on or something. I, I still think it's, it's going to be a major goal of of the Democrat, and then if a Republican candidate, then we'll, we'll be getting more enforcement uh, proposals, at least from the ones that have, have uh, who are running. I understand. Uh, comprehensive immigration reform is the worst way to reform our immigration system, except for all the other ones. And what I mean by that is that if you wanted state experimentation, you would have to pass legislation to enable it. That means you'd have to go through Congress on immigration. Not going to happen if you can't pass immigration reform. Let's do a peace bill. Why don't we do, you know, the Dream Act and some other pieces and high skilled and immigration, maybe some enforcement measures, put them together. But if you can get a political balance on a small package, it means there's the political will to do the big package, and people want to do the big package, not the small package. So, well, let's just do more on executive actions. We won't have to mess with Congress at all. Okay, but you can do half temporary measures that are susceptible to court challenge and changes in administration, and they're not permanent. So the fact is, is that the Constitution says that the plenary authority for immigration policy resides with the Congress, and they've got to act. So we need an act of Congress to change it. And I think from a policy perspective and from a, uh, a strategy perspective, the comprehensive immigration reform offers the best opportunity to modernize our immigration system. So it's very difficult to do on this legislation. There's a good reason why Sun Min Kim is skeptical about Congress. He covers it every day. They don't do big things often. They hardly ever do, especially now. So um, we realize what a mountain it is to climb, but we've been climbing the mountain. I think we're getting close to the top. Yeah, and just to add to that, because I didn't want to raise the whole comprehensive piecemeal thing, I think Democrats are in a place now where they recognize, they believe that the only way to fix the entire system is to do it all together. Um, and I think that was clearly the sentiment back in um, 2013 when the gang of came together and put together the bill. But in the last several years, there I think there has been a rising, um, this rising distaste from Republicans to do everything together. Um, not necessarily on immigration, although obviously that, but also just on the massive omnibus spending bills that get put together every December. I mean, the Freedom Caucus is so angry about the, those kinds of things. And there, are, and there are desires from Republicans to do fix different parts of the immigration system in different ways. Obviously, you know, there was a hearing this morning in judiciary on fixing the EB-5 program, the very, you know, small part of the immigration system. Um, I was talking with a very conservative member, conservative Republican member of Congress this morning who is astounded that, you know, the H-1B program, which we know um, the quota on visas fills up within days every April, is the way it is. Um, but this is a member who is not going to he wants to fix the H-1B system, but he's not going to move on the undocumented issue. So there are, so it's just, it's, I, I feel like House and Senate Republicans are kind of more adamant than ever that one day package doesn't work, um, whereas Democrats clearly feel the opposite. So that's another issue.
Yeah, just one other thought. I, I think the, the big significance of this case, and I really think in Mark can comment, the reason the justices want to take, is they wanted to find the limits, uh, the balance of powers here. Where Congress needs to go, where the executive can and can't go. And when they do that, which I think they will, will do, it'll help set the table for what's next and who's, you know, and I don't know how, I can't analyze how the policies will play out there, but it will clarify roles and what's possible, what the administration is able to do, what Congress has to do. And I think that'll help clear some of the air and some of the underbrush that we've been getting bogged down in on immigration reform moving forward. Can you comment on that real quick? Sure. Um, just that, uh, you know, as we heard in the last panel, you know, there's a lot of issues. Um, if the court reaches the merits, and, and it may help clarify that, and it was the court itself that raised the take care clause issue, which is uh, uh, you know, on a very different level than issues over the Administrative Procedure Act. But um, it was interesting to me that in, in the briefs, uh, the, the administration spent just a couple pages, a few pages on it. But even Texas, five pages out of an 80-page brief, Texas did not really seize on the take care clause question as a major part of this argument. Um, so we'll see how that plays out in oral argument. Yeah, I had a question for Gene, I think, which is, um, do you have a sense that the government's going to be, I know that the NGOs have been working hard to ramp up, but do you have a sense that the government's going to be able to ramp up very quickly after June 30th to, to entertain these applications? And I totally agree that we ought to be encouraging people to file them. And, and just a, a question, just a, also a second question for the others. What does happen in terms of momentum for legislative reform, though, if you get if a positive Supreme Court decision, in other words, a decision from the, for the administration and the Democratic um, um, president, does that kind of diminish momentum for comprehensive reform or increase it? So, as you know, the government has not been able to do anything on preparing since the injunction. So, um, fortunately, though, they were within days of implementing the expanded DACA. So, we think that they'll be able to roll that out quickly. They assure us that they can. Um, and a lot of the preparation for that will kind of feed the preparation for DAPA. So they don't, we're not getting direct, like we expect it to take this many days, but we are hopeful that they know how important this is. They have the same goals of getting as many people to apply as possible, so that we are hopeful that they will gear up fairly quickly. On the second part of your question, Donna, uh, it, it's hard to imagine what this scenario will be. Um, and how it will affect legislation. I mean, let's just take one scenario. A, a Supreme Court decides in favor of the government, immigrants start to come forward, uh, Hillary Clinton gets elected president, the House flips to Democrats, and the Republicans maintain control of the House. Republicans are furious, right? Uh, on the other hand, from their point of view, in terms of what they're interested in, the pieces they're most interested in are not the legalization piece. That's the piece they're least interested in. And they're going to say, oh, the Democrats are getting just about everything they want, and we've got nothing. What does that do to the negotiating dynamic? Does that make them more willing to come? Or if a Paul Ryan wants to do something, does he say, look, give me a limiting principle on executive action so I can sell the rest of it to, you know? Uh, it, it's, it's hard to game out. Uh, you know, but, but I think there's going to be a perception on the part of Republicans that Democrats have gotten most of what they wanted in that scenario. But there's going to be a perception on the part of advocates and many Democrats as a result saying we haven't gotten nearly enough. Um, so it, it's going to complicate, I think, the negotiating dynamic. But maybe in the end, not that much, is my sense, even in that scenario. Hi, I'm Sonia Schwartz at Georgetown Center for Children and Families. Um, I come at this a little bit from the perspective of health reform implementation and getting millions of people to enroll in a new in new options for health affordable health coverage. And my question's for Jean, which is that as part of the Affordable Care Act, we got a lot of resources, never enough, to do the outreach and enrollment. And um, we still, some of those resources still exist, they're diminishing, but one thing I've been thinking a lot about is how can we retrain some of the people um, that do that work to help with some pre-screening or you know or other things for 
for our adopt program if it goes forward. And I'm wondering if there's that, that conversation started or not. The conversation has started. I would say some of the agencies that I mentioned, kind of multi-purpose agencies, were engaged in the ACA work. And so they not only bring with the experience, but also ideas and collaboration. I would say that they're that further concentric circle that I talked about that is really hard to engage at this point when they're not already connected with one of our, um, one of the agencies around the country also serving immigrants. Uh, so maybe we should talk and some, share some ideas. Okay, we have time for one more question. Hearing none, uh, do any of the panelists want to make a final comment about uh, make predictions or <laughs> give us the odds, whatever the case may be? Okay, I'll just a couple more quick thoughts about the, the possible outcomes. Because um, when you asked about a tie, and, and I was talking about one kind of uh, case where they reached back to 1947 to, to say where the court had, had actually you know, issued the deadlock and then reheard. But, um, you know, more recently in 2005, when there were two vacancies on the court, uh, and it was clear that we were going to get uh, Justice Alito eventually. And just, there, there was never uh, an actually empty seat on the court that term because Justice O'Connor extended her term, but she did not want to be the deciding vote in any 5 4 decisions. And uh, even though she decided some cases that weren't 5 4, um, the court did re argue three cases, but it's still just sort of unclear like what the court thinks about like how it should do that. Or the court has internal rules for certain things and, and it's not clear that this is a much different situation. Um, if, if you know if there's a tie it does affirm the circuit which which upheld the injunction and um, you know, that's really kind of the end of the program for this administration. Merits. I, I wouldn't. Expect, I might be bold to say I wouldn't expect a ruling on the merits uh, for. Well, I, I don't know. Uh, the, the ruling on the merits could go either way. I suppose. But I think the court is going to try to avoid. Okay. Well, thank thank you to all our panelists. Let's give them a round of applause, please.